Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, last week, Paul let the Ephesian church know how he was praying for them. And you know, we know he, he prayed for the Philippians, he's praying for the Ephesians. Praying was one of the things he could do while he was in prison in Rome. Because no prison can keep the Spirit of God out. No, spirit, uh, no, no prison can uh, keep prayers in, right? Those walls kind of vanish uh, when you get that vertical component. And so Paul was, yeah. So Paul, Paul was telling how he's praying for them. And the things he prayed for for the Philippian church uh, were wisdom, always good to have. Be careful when you pray for that because wisdom comes through sometimes difficult paths. Uh, for wisdom and revelation, which we saw as uh, the Greek word apocalypsos, or if you look at it, apocalypsis is what it looks like. So praying for apocalypse for you guys. And I don't know where we got well, like a negative connotation to the word apocalypse. All it means is that you're pulling the veil off, you're shining light on it, the things are being revealed. And so he's praying that they would have wisdom and that things of God would be revealed for them. Cue the wind. The Holy Spirit, right? Don't know where it goes, it's like the wind. Don't know where it goes, where it comes from. So, so basically he's praying that they would know God more and more, that their inner bookshelf, we talked about the inner bookshelf, that it would be uh, added to with the things of God and that they would know that there's an amazing inheritance also on the horizon. So he prayed for revelation and wisdom so they would be equipped to be the church. Uh, to be the church. We saw that the church, Paul says, is the fullness of Christ. When we gather, when we are the body of Christ, we are the fullness of Christ, and that's an awesome thing. And Jesus, Paul said, is the head of everything for the church. He is for us. He is for his church body. So we saw the church isn't some place you go. It's not something you knock off your list on Sunday. I'm going to go to church. I went to church. Check that box, right? I'm good. I'm good. Me and a man upstairs. We good now. No, it doesn't work that way. That's not, it's not something you do. It's not a place you go. We saw that uh, church is something we are. Church is our DNA. It's the DNA of Christ in us as we are the hands and feet of Jesus as his body going out and doing the work of of loving and extending grace to people. So we are the church. It's something we are. It's not something we do. Uh, in chapter 1, we saw that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all in agreement in that we are chosen, that we are wanted, that we are loved. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work and act on our behalf, and that, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that is for us, His church. That same power is for us. Then in chapter 2, he starts talking about uh, what that immeasurable power means for us as His people. He's talking we, he's like... Boom, 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 praise fireworks, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, yeah! Uh, now he's going to talk about what that means to us, which means we're going to get a little bad news first. Because regarding us, you got to have the bad news before you can get the good news, right? And unfortunately, we're going to run out of time before we can get to the good part today, so I apologize in advance for that. Uh, so the bad news, he's, he's going to be talking about the old neighborhood. It's like, man, this is what you guys used to be. This is where you used to live. But it's past tense. You ever live someplace that wasn't great? Right? I'm, not very many of us like walk into life in adulthood with, you know, full wallets and, you know, I'm going to buy that six bedroom, 10,000 square foot house in, you know, the nice neighborhood. You don't have that option. I remember living in some apartments and, you know, getting broken into them was just like a regular thing. It's like, it's going to happen. Nobody ever got my guitars. It's a miracle of God. They broke in one time. They stole my class ring, but didn't take my guitars. And I'm good because I couldn't afford to replace them then at all. But yet, if you've ever lived in those places, those apartments, and they're okay. Uh, you know, sometimes they're in a neighborhood that uh, a little sketchy. I, I lived in one that I thought was all right. It was a nice, clean little apartment complex. Knew the neighbors. Everything was good. And well, then one night I hear gunshots. Got up, walked around the corner, and sure enough, somebody drive-by shooting, blood everywhere. I'm like, all right, so this is maybe not the neighborhood I want to stay in for the rest of my life. Uh, similar thing with the duplex. Sleeping one night, and 
and uh, hear this pop. I'm like, what was that? I came from the direction of the kids' room. We got up, went in there, and there's a hole in the window and a hole in the wall. Somebody had like shot a gun through, and my son was sleeping in there. Yeah, so well, maybe this is not the neighborhood we want to stay in. So Paul's talking about the old neighborhood where the Ephesians used to live. Uh, so Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions. Oh, this is going to get... It's going to get a little bummer here. You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving wrath. So, as for you, you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you walked, following the course of this world. As for you, you were dead. And that's past tense. I'm so glad. He speaks to them as past tense. This is where you used to live. Uh, I speak to you guys. I hope that's your past tense. If that's your present tense, move. <laughs> Take your spirit and move. All right? He's, God has adopted us. He's brought us into his household. He brings us to his table. And just, just move. Get away from that stuff and move. But I like that it's in the past tense, you know, for this Ephesian church. And that's where they used to live, man. It was a very heavy Greek influence, and they did what Greeks do. Greek culture was pretty permissive, and reminds me of a culture I see out there now. Uh, so as for you, you were dead in your sins, and thank goodness it's past tense. So as you were living, you were living physically, you were drawing breath, you had cellular respiration going, right? Your cells are doing the cell thing, and you're living, you're breathing, the blood's going through your veins. But, but spiritually, you guys were dead. So you're like living dead. So basically, he's saying they were zombies. All right? I'm just going to throw that as my interpretation, uh, the Dwayne version of things. Uh, basically, you guys were zombies. You were not as alive. You were living, but you were not as alive as you could have been. Right? So you're like walking dead. Physically alive, spiritually not living. Uh, there, there, sometimes movies come out that are unintentionally Christian, and I just love that, where there's a redemption story. And I think we were talking to you guys about The Warm Bodies, the zombie movie. Kind of a romantic comedy. Uh, and it ended up with this really great redemption story where the zombies are there but the zombies start a little spoiler alert still worth seeing the zombies start coming back to life because somebody sees something good in them starts believing in them and the zombies their hearts start to beat again they come back to life and so paul's like man this is what you were this isn't what you are now you were dead in your trespasses and sins trespasses that that's willfully <laughs> I just love being out here this time of year. This is awesome. It's raining pine needles. <laughs> Other churches don't have pine needles falling on them today. Amen. So trespasses, that's willfully going where you shouldn't. Has anybody ever trespassed? Just you. Am I the only one? I might have <laughs> for, for a shortcut, maybe there's a fishing hole and you know it's on private property, you got to go through private property to do it. Catching frogs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a story I want to tell. Uh, there, when we were in high school in biology, we got extra credit if we brought our own frogs to dissect. Now we knew where the frogs lived, right? And they were in Brentwood Park Lake. Lakewood Lake. Uh, there were lots of you could hear them out there at night. So we're like, we don't have memberships. We're going to get into those places, and we're going to get you know we're going to get us some frogs. And we set out, and uh, somebody I, I actually got somebody to let me in Brentwood Lake, but I didn't have a membership. And somebody found me out there and invited me to leave because I was trespassing. So that one didn't pan out. Lakewood, I think we got ran off of that one too. We ended up in Sugar Pine Lake, right? The upper pond. And I don't even know if you can get in there now anymore, but 
But we knew there were frogs out there. So right by this time it's dark. We're out there and some guy comes out on his deck, he hears us because we're just teenage boys, right? It looks sketchier than it was. <laughs> right, teenage boys out there under the cover of darkness at the lake. He comes out, I'm gonna sick my dogs on you, and sure enough, woo woo, these dogs, and so we're just <laughs> running. I fell into a hole up to about here. I don't know what that was all about. Lucky I didn't break my leg, but we were we were trespassing. We were where we shouldn't have been. It did not go well. We did not get any frogs. Uh, my friend Barry put his blazer in a ditch right over here, and we had to like dig that out. And it was, you know, trespassing is where we shouldn't have been, and it could all have been avoided had we not been trespassing, basically. So, yeah, so trespassing willfully going where you shouldn't and then so much of our sin is like that it's like i i see the no trespassing sign god put that there he put it there for my protection but i'm going to go anyway i'm going to shortcut i'm going to shortcut through that i'm going to go in that willfully going where you shouldn't trespasses and sins and sin is the greek word hamartia i told my wife don't let me forget how to pronounce that hamartia <laughs> hamartia i guess you know it means to miss it means to miss the mark, to be inaccurate, to go out and shoot at a target and not hit the target. To shoot for a bullseye and maybe get a little over, maybe miss the target altogether. Uh, it's, it means to miss, to not be 100% accurate. This one doesn't even have to be our fault. Right? We can think we're doing good. And when you miss, that's, that's rarely something you intentionally set out to do. You're trying to hit a target. You're trying to be accurate. Sometimes you miss, and it's, it's not something you, you intentionally do. Uh, it could just be a, a, as simple as a misinterpretation of data. It's like, I thought I had it right. I looked at it, and that's what it looked like. Well, and behold, I was wrong. I was inaccurate. It wasn't my fault. But if you're wrong with sincerity, you're still wrong, right? In the old days, people used to think that, that the earth, or that the sun revolved around the earth, that the universe revolved around the earth. They call that the geocentric theory, where they thought, and you can kind of understand how that happens. You can stand here, and I don't feel like I'm moving, but I can see the sun, I can see the stars, I can see everything else moving through the sky, so I must be stationary, right? You can kind of understand that. But along came this guy named Copernicus, who uh, published a work in 1543 that challenged geocentrism with heliocentrism. It's like, I think that actually all this is rotating around the sun. I think the sun's at the center of the galaxy. And uh, then with the invention of the telescope in the early 1600s, um, Galileo and Kepler kind of took that idea and moved it downfield. Uh, it eventually became accepted as truth, but it was not without opposition initially. Because people are like, no, man, this is, this is what we've believed. Especially the church, because they're, they're dug in. This is what we believe. This is what we have believed. And this is what we're going to continue to believe. And if you come at us with this sun theory, then we're going to call you heretic. We're going to excommunicate you. We're going to put you on trial. And they did. Didn't sit well with the Catholic church. People definitely underwent threats of excommunication over the heliocentric theory. Now this just shows me, as I was thinking about that, it shows me that the church isn't always right about stuff either. Sometimes a church gets things wrong. Uh, they're not always right about things, neither is science. So we're just kind of caught here in the middle, trying to figure stuff out. People in modern Christianity, we, we tend to think sometimes that, that science and Christianity are at odds, that they're diametrically opposed, that they are enemies. We start talking about how old is the earth, really? 4,000, 5,000, 4.5 billion. How old is the universe, really? Did God create everything with the appearance of age? Or did he use like natural processes over epics? Or did he do like a combination of all the above, you know? I don't really worry much about this. I, I don't. Uh, I think science is in the process of catching up with God. I think someday, and maybe you know, not till we're on the other side, when we get that inheritance, we're sitting around that, that table in heaven, that science and God are going to intersect and we're going to understand a lot. I don't worry about it at this point. Uh, 
Case in point, science holds that there was a big bang, that everything in the universe came from a central point all at once, right? And Crash Course, if you haven't seen Crash Course, they do, it's on YouTube, this YouTube Crash Course, and they, they do all these like super condensed, very engaging uh, little presentations of science and history. And they've got a great one on the, on the, the science of how the universe came to be. And that everything in the universe was concentrated in something smaller than the head of a pin and just <laughs> blew up outward. I'm like, well, that kind of makes sense. That kind of, you know, like Genesis 1 1, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created. And that kind of lines up with that. And they have a really difficult time explaining how that happened because part of uh, physics is that you can't create or destroy matter had to come from somewhere. And they have a heck of a time with that. I'm like, well, it kind of makes sense. Here's one of those things where, you know, science is kind of catching up with God. I love it. So yeah, we might get things wrong by misinterpreting the data. We might miss the mark by seeing things from the wrong perspective. But the good news here is that God's grace covers both our trespassing, our willful disobedience, and our wrong conclusions and misinterpreting the data. So God's grace, covers both. I'm happy about it. So take a deep breath. It's going to be okay. See, it's going to be all right. So Paul tells the Ephesians, paraphrase here, as for you, you were zombies in trespassing and just being wrong. And that was the neighborhood you guys used to live in. That's where you used to live. That was your ecosystem where you existed. And you're following the ways of the world. And in the Greek, this implies a passive meandering. Kind of like the, the pine needles coming down out of the tree. They're just kind of passively meandering, going with the air current. Uh, we were up for a wedding recently up in Kennedy Meadows. And we got there early because we didn't know what the situation was going to be. And had a little time, so we sat down by the river. And there were some guys out there fishing. You know, they got their super expensive fly rods and they're out there. And like literally right in front of us, here's these trout. Bloop. <laughs> They're out there fishing. Just we had just like scads of trout right here, like breaching, coming out of the water, and you know, eating. And and it was it was beautiful. And just to sit there, I like to catch fish too. But sometimes it's fun just to watch them. Uh, the only fish that goes downstream passively is dead. Right. <laughs> They're dead, they belly up, and they just kind of go with the current. Live trout, they actually face against the current because that's where their food comes from. So they're, they're not just passively flowing around, they're actually, and they're quite agile, and they're pretty savage little predators when you watch them. And so they're, they're facing upstream, and they're, you know, they're using energy to stay face against the current because that's where they get fed. So used to flow downhill he's like now you guys are facing upstream you're like facing against the current you're engaged you're you're doing good stuff here so Paul says you were zombies just going with the flow following the prince of the power of the air the prince of what huh the fresh prince of Bel Air no I, I, don't, I don't think that <laughs> the prince of the power of the air that that he's talking about Satan he's talking about the accuser the adversary of all that is good in our lives. And uh, you used to go along, you used to, used to flow and follow that guy. And you don't anymore. Again, it's past tense, you don't do that. Uh, the prince of the power of the air, this is an interesting terminology. That's like the, speaking of the zone between the higher heavens and the earth, where we occupy, where we live, where we draw breath, where we exist and he does his work where we live. Big surprise, right? And he does, you know, his work, his work, the Bible tells us, is to kill, steal, and destroy all crimes and felonies. I work in corrections, and I'm, you know, these are all crimes and felonies, and these are, every one of these guys, you know, in that, inside those walls, they're, they're, they've done something like this to put them there. And that is the work of our accuser to kill, steal, and destroy. And he does seem to have a certain amount of sway in this world, doesn't he? As you look around, what's going on, Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Hamas, uh, 
you have people, man, as soon as you can convince yourself that your, your enemy, the person on the other side is no longer human and valid, people become capable of incredibly bad atrocities. And, you know, that's, that's what happened. It, it's happened politically, where anybody that doesn't align with me, I'm ex-political party and everybody on the other side, they're just stupid, they're dumb, they don't even count, they're blah, blah, blah. And Satan, the accuser, the prince of the power of the air, sits back, pats himself on the back and nods his head, because that's what he loves, that's what he wants, that's what he likes. The crimes that people commit against each other that fit that kill, steal, destroy template. It's like, why would you do that? They're, these flash mob robberies where people just go in and like steal a store to the bare bones, why is that okay? That's bad human behavior. I always thought, if, you know, if it's not yours, don't take it. And these people, somehow, they get it in their head that that's okay, and they go and they take stuff that's not theirs, and the prince of the power of the air, the enemy, the accuser, sits back, pats himself on the back. Good job. The exploitation of people by other people with power, money, and evil motives. Prince of the power of the air goes, yeah, good work. I like that. But there's something about this prince of the power of the air, this accuser, I want to tell you guys today that he has no creative power of his own. He created nothing. He creates nothing. Uh, instead, he just steals God's creativity and he takes credit for it. The creativity of people is the fingerprint of God in them, that we are made in God's image and God is creative. He makes us creative and uh, the accuser will steal it, corrupt it, and misuse it. Uh, art, right? Even there are some really raunchy movies out there. There's really raunchy music. And these are creative things. And even that sources with creativity that is a gift from God. And then it is taken, corrupted, manipulated, turned around to be a bad thing. The accuser does not have any creative power in and of himself. It's like he takes a hammer, you know, it's meant to build things up. You take a hammer and nails and you can make things. You can fasten wood together. Well, you might be, I can't. <laughs> I'm not good at it. But Eric you know, can. yeah, and you can build things. And, and it's like, you know, the accuser, the Satan, the enemy will take this hammer that can build things and he'll turn it around and make you hit yourself in the head with it. <laughs> right? And he'll sit back and go, good job. It's just what I had in mind. You know, he's, he's no good. That's why sin is generally some kind of perversion or destructive alternative to legitimate desires of human nature. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, The thief comes in only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Bring that on. There's a little, there's a little bright light in this, right? Amen. Amen. Oh, and hallelujah. hallelujah. <laughs> And Paul says that counterfeit, cheap, knockoff spirit is still at work in those who are disobedient. And the Greek word for disobedient here is ap apithia. And it means obstinate or stubborn, dug in against the goodness of God, dug in against love, dug in against anything that is good and true of God. And he says that all of us lived among them at one time, in the old neighborhood, right, the old heezy, gratifying the cravings of the flesh, and in the original language, being children of wrath. So that's where we're going to end it today. Sorry about that. I see the Ephesians like, Paul, you killed our buzz, man. You were like, it was so good back there in chapter 1. And now, mm, what are you doing? But it gets better. It gets better. So that's where the Ephesian Christians once lived. That's where I think we all lived at one point or another. Uh, some of us more intensely than others, but I think we all have lived and we still struggle with you know, being in the old neighborhood, wanting to go back and visit the old neighborhood. That old neighborhood where goodness was corrupted and, the counter, and was counterfeited in big ways and subtle small ways. Where people were duped into trespassing. It's like, you can go in there past that sign. Go ahead, go ahead, you know? 
where we just thought we were right but got it wrong and we didn't give space to change for ourselves because we were attached to the status quo. Yeah, kind of a bummer coming off the Amen Hallelujah fireworks grand finale that uh, Paul presented in chapter 1. But the Amen and the Hallelujah are going to come back. Right? They're going to be back next week. Uh, Paul talks about Everything Paul talks about in the old neighborhood is past tense. And so he's going to move on past that. He had to give you the bad news first, so we can now talk about the good news of how all this, this unanimous decision of Father, Son, Holy Spirit to choose us, to bring us to the table, to redeem us, to pay the price for us, how that all affects us now. He had to go to the bad news. and go, This is what you once were. This is what used to happen. It's not what happens anymore. So you got to properly look at all, how all God's goodness, choosing, adopting, redeeming, indwelling applies to us. We have to go back and look at the bad news first. Now, I want to leave you guys, though. I don't just want to leave you hanging with that. that. <laughs> all right. Let's pray and go. Look with me at verse 4, if you will. Just the way it starts. But because of this great love, because of his great love for us. Where is that I was laughing? Huh? I was laughing. Chapter 2-4. Ephesians 2 4. But because of his great love for us, uh, I kind of like the way the English Standard Version and King James and New King James put it. But God. Oh man, it's so much of my past, when I was at my worst, there was that, now there's but God. Right? But God was not done. But God. So there's your amen and your hallelujah for this morning come down the pipeline again we'll have to wait and get into it next week though so don't deny what where you used to live don't just write that out of your history sometimes it's good to remember the neighborhood i used to live in man the, the old spiritual apartment complex right where bad things happen i don't live there anymore man i moved out i god has brought me in and he's moved me to his table to share his sustenance with me, to share his community with me. Uh, so don't be afraid to look back. Don't live there. You don't have to live there anymore. Uh, we struggle with wanting to go back, and if you keep wanting to go back, don't. If you find yourself back there doing those things, get out and go back home, right? So uh, yeah, next week, the amen and hallelujah that come down the pipeline again. So do join us for that. Uh, Lord, we thank you uh, that we are alive. I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. And uh, just pray that, that that song, that lyric will be resonating in our hearts. Lord, what we used to be, thank you that you don't leave us as you find us. That you, yeah, you fish from the bottom of the pond, but you clean your catch. And Lord, that you don't just leave us alone. That you cause us to grow. You bring us out of what we used to be. You bring us into what you want us to be. And it's an ongoing process. It's a beautiful process. Sometimes it's fun, sometimes it hurts, sometimes it's uncomfortable, but you bring us out of what we used to be into what we are now and what we're becoming. And Lord, that is some good news. And uh, as all of us, Lord, I pray that we would uh, have a look in the rearview mirror of where we've come from, the things we've done, the things uh, are, are not proud moments. And thank you that you've led us out of that, that uh, you've brought us to your table, you've adopted us into your family. And, uh, Lord, we just want to get up and keep moving. Keep us just not floating downstream like dead fish. Lord, we pray that, that we would uh, be active, that we would be facing upstream, that we would be against the current that comes against us. And uh, that's where we will find our life. And I just thank you again for the day that uh, we are still outside on a beautiful day like this. And, pray that as we go through this week that we would enjoy, Lord, what you are doing in us and with us. And uh, that we would keep our eyes toward heaven and the inheritance that uh, we will have, that we have some of now that we will have fully one day. And just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.